Well, I want to begin uh, this message. I'm calling it Restoration from Devastation. And what I'm talking about is the restoration from devastation of sin. Sin that has been done against us or maybe sins we've committed. But sin causes devastation. It breaks hearts. It destroys families. It destroys nations. It destroys communities. And God hates sin because he loves people. Because sin is destructive to the people that he loves. But thank God in Jesus Christ, that's the gospel, the good news, there is restoration from the devastation of sin. There's, there's forgiveness, there's healing, and there's restoration. So I want to begin by telling you an incident that happened to me years ago when I was on staff at a church in the Palm Springs, California area over 30 years ago, probably 35, close to 40 years ago. And uh, there was a, a man that was also uh, part of the staff of that church I was at. His name was David. And there was a, we were on a staff retreat. He came to me privately one time and he said uh, that he felt impressed, he felt led by the Lord to share his personal testimony with me. Now, I'll be honest with you, when he first told me that, I started to cringe a little bit. Because I know that this man had come out of a lifestyle of homosexuality. And uh, at that time, I just, I was really ignorant about anything having to do with that. And honestly, it, it made me uncomfortable. And um, so I remember saying, uh, sure, but inside I was sort of cringing a little bit. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I want to hear this. But I'm so glad he told me because what he shared with me changed me for the better. It uh, showed me how ignorant I was and it really opened my eyes. I want to share with you his testimony to begin this message called Restoration from Devastation. Uh, David shared with me how as long as he could remember from the time he was a small boy, and by the way, the time he was telling me this, he was a Christian who had been delivered out of the homosexual lifestyle. But he told me that from the time far back as he could remember, he'd always wanted to be a girl and do girl things. He said, even a little boy, I wanted to play with dolls. I didn't want anything to do with being a boy. And of course, um, he, he, in that way, he acted effeminate. He wanted to be like his mother. And growing up in school, naturally, uh, other kids made fun of him. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was uh, excluded, made fun of. That was painful for him because he didn't know why he was like he was. He just felt that's the way he was. And so he, he stayed that way all through school, and he suffered a lot of rejection and loneliness, misunderstanding. As he grew into a young adult, he got into homosexual relationships and lived that way for several years. I'm not sure exactly how old he was when he encountered Christ. I think he was in his late 20s. But at some point in his life, he heard the gospel. The Holy Spirit convicted him. He repented and gave his life to Christ. And uh, he stopped his homosexual lifestyle he loved the Lord. He was truly born again and now living for Christ. But he found himself still struggling. This was his testimony. He found himself still struggling with same-sex attraction. He said, just like maybe a, whole, a heterosexual, healthy heterosexual man might be tempted to lust to, after a woman, he said, I felt the same kind of attraction toward man. He said, I knew it was sinful. I knew it was wrong. I didn't want to do it. But I couldn't get the the desires to stop. And he said, I went to a, a ministry that helped people get recover and healing, and healing from homosexuality. And these were other men who had been set free by Jesus Christ. And he said, uh, while I was at that retreat, part of the instructions they gave him uh, during one of the in-between sessions was to find a quiet place alone with the Lord and pray. 
and ask the Lord questions. And then he, they said they taught them to wait on the Lord with, and listen and see if God would speak to their heart. So he said, I did that. He said, I got alone. And he said, I asked the Lord. He said, Lord, I love you. I, I want to live a righteous and a holy life. Why is it that I still have these same-sex desires? And I felt that way all my life. I don't want to have these desires, but I can't change. So why am I like this? And he said as he waited before the Lord. Now, let me just say this. Having a temptation is not a sin. That's called brokenness. All of us, every one of us has brokenness. You may, if you're watching or hearing this, maybe you have those. You can identify with that kind of temptation. Maybe you can't. But all of us came into this world broken and sinful. We came into families, no matter even if our families were Christian, and tried to raise us the best they could. They didn't do everything right. I certainly didn't. I wish I had been a better parent. So all of us have come into the world broken, and we've all been sinned against. So in our brokenness, we can have a propensity or temptations towards certain things. The temptation is not a sin. The Bible refers to that as our iniquity. But unless you act on your iniquity, it's not a sin. An iniquity is a propensity or a leaning toward something that's wrong. David said, I've kept myself from my iniquities. When you go ahead and give in to it, that's a transgression. That's a sin. So being tempted is not a sin, even if it's a perverse you know, temptation. So he said, as he waited before the Lord, he said to me, Joah, he said, I've never had a vision in my life. Never had a vision. But as I waited before the Lord, I was shocked and I had my first vision. He said, I was surprised at what I saw. And as I had the vision, as I looked into what I was seeing, I was able to relive and refill the emotions of what I saw in the vision. Here's what he saw. He said, I saw myself as about a six-month-old infant boy. I saw myself in a bedroom in a crib. And I was crying. I wanted to be held and, or, or fed. He just said, I was crying for attention. And he said, I saw my mother come into the room and she was approaching me to come pick me up and comfort me or feed me. And he said, but before she could get to me, I saw my father come in and he was an alcoholic. He was drunk. He, I saw a beer can in his hand. He was angry. And he stepped in between uh, my mother and me, pushed her away, cursed at her. Uh, and then he cursed at me. He wanted... I think if I remember, he wanted to maybe even slap the baby, but his mother stopped him. And then he was physically violent with her. He said, I had no natural way to ever remember that in the natural, unless God had brought it back and showed me in the vision. But as I relived it, it came alive. He said, I saw myself in the crib and he said, uh, see the devastation of sin. He said, at that moment, I saw and I felt my infant heart close toward my father. I looked at him and hated him. And my heart closed. And I said to myself, I hate you. I'll never be like you. He said, I looked at my mother and said, I'm going to be like you. The Lord showed him that. He never knew that that took place. And then the Holy Spirit said to him, at that point, a demonic entity came and attached itself to that bitterness, the hatred, the unforgiveness, and the vow. He had made a vow in his heart. And of course, now here's what I want to interject right here. Which of us in the same situation wouldn't do something similar if we were that infant? He said, the Holy Spirit led me to forgive my father, to repent, to renounce the vow I made that said I never want to be like you and to repent of hating him. And he said, I did that. And then I accepted the Lord who God made me to be. He said, when I prayed that, he said that thing inside me was broken and God delivered me from the, uh, that desire to be homosexual. 
Isn't that an awesome testimony? Now, what that did to me was just open my eyes because as I heard him, <laughs> my heart was so moved. It's so easy to judge other people's sins. Not just homosexuality. We can judge anybody else's sins. We can judge their anger, their short temper, their lust, their uh, addiction. But we don't know what they went through. We don't know what kind of devastation came to them it, 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 that caused the brokenness. So he said, uh, when he shared that, I remember just thinking, God, there's the only reason, this is what I thought, that I'm not uh, in the same boat as him is I didn't have the same situation, circumstances happen to me. I think any person would have made a similar decision that David did if they'd gone through that kind of abuse. Now, I want to throw this also out. Statistically, in the high 90%, there's no way to prove this, but through surveys, uh, everyone who's in a homosexual lifestyle or bondage has been seriously violated and abused either sexually, emotionally, verbally, mentally, or all of the above. What happens is people become so damaged Without Christ, we don't know how to respond in righteousness. We just respond in whatever way we know how to survive. And it's usually a sinful response. And uh, so what happens is there are spiritual laws. And a spiritual law is just that. It's a spiritual law. It's no different than the law of gravity. If you take a good person and a bad person, and they both accidentally step off the edge of a cliff... No matter how good the person is, they're going to fall because of the law of gravity. A bad person will fall, a good person will fall. So there are spiritual laws set in place in God's kingdom. They're just laws. And when we violate those laws, we suffer from them. And so sin comes in, it causes devastation. Our response to sin is often sinful because we don't know how to walk in God's ways when we're young and we're sinned against. And that sets up more devastation in our life and the devastation of sin keeps perpetuating. But thank God, when we come to Christ, He can forgive us, cleanse us, and restore us and reverse all the devastation and restore uh, what happened. Uh, here's some, some of the spiritual laws. The Bible says, if you don't forgive, if we don't forgive, Jesus said that in Mark chapter 11, we will not be forgiven. So holding unforgiveness can cause us to go into bondage. If you read Matthew chapter 18, uh, when we have bitterness and unforgiveness, we can be turned over to demonic tormenting spirits. Now this doesn't seem fair. And I want to say this. Maybe in, you can think of a situation where someone was wrongly violated and it's very hard for them to forgive. You think that doesn't seem fair. I want to say this. It's not fair. Life is not fair. All of us have been sinned against, and all of us have sinned against other people. And, but the, the equalizer, the forgiver, the restorer is Jesus. So no matter how much injustice has happened, if each of us will turn to the Lord, that's where healing is. I remember hearing uh, of a woman at one of T.L. Osborne's evangelistic crusades in Africa. They brought her in a wheelbarrow. She was uh, uh, demon-possessed, out of her mind, and paralyzed. And uh, she was there. They brought her to hear the gospel message. And when T.L. Osborne prayed uh, a mass prayer of healing and deliverance, the demons that had possessed her and made her out of her mind came out of her. She was restored. She gave her life to Christ. Now listen to her story. How did she get demon-possessed, out of her mind, and in a wheelchair. She was sinned against. There was war in that country. I think it was Tanzania, if I remember correctly. She had been raped by some soldiers. And the, the injustice done against her had filled her heart with anger, hatred, and unforgiveness. The hatred that she had opened a door for a demon to come and oppress her and eventually enter her. It's not fair. She was sinned against. But no matter how unfair it is, there are spiritual laws. 
So when we break those spiritual laws, further devastation comes. So the only answer is everybody who's sinned or been sinned against has to turn to Jesus. We have to forgive. We have to be forgiven and be delivered. So David renounced his, his uh, bitterness and hatred toward his father. Uh, he renounced the vow that said, I'll never be like you. He, uh, and he was, he was set free. He repented of judging his father. Here's another spiritual law. Judge not that you be not judged. It's a spiritual law. Uh, and um, he accepted. Here's the other thing he did. He accepted. He said, Lord, I accept who you made me to be. Ephesians chapter 10 says that in Christ, we are his workmanship. And God has made us for good works that he's foreordained. So he accepted that. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God has a plan and a future for us, for everyone that hears me right now. You might be in sin. You may have been sinned against, but God has a future and a plan for you. But in order to walk in it, we have to come to Christ. So David was completely delivered. Here's what Psalm 145, verse 8, it says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. By the way, I saw David a few years ago, probably... Within the last five to six years, he told me that testimony maybe 35 years ago. I saw him a few years ago when I went out of town. I ran into him. He's been married for decades and he's happy and whole in Christ. Isn't that an awesome testimony? Uh, here's Psalm 86 verse 5. It says, Lord, you're good. You're ready to forgive. You're abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. 2 Peter 3 Verse 9 says, The Lord is long-suffering toward us. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God is good. Sin happens. Sin brings devastation, but Christ forgives. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, and the truth will set us free. So freedom is found in Christ. That testimony of David impacted my life. It changed me. Because prior to hearing that, I couldn't understand for the life of me why someone would want to be homosexual. And it's very easy to be self-righteous and judgmental toward other people's sins when we don't understand it. But after he shared that with me, I repented in my heart before God. I said, God, I'm sorry I've judged people. I had no idea that that's what happens and makes people respond and the truth is, all of us have been broken, we've all been sinned against, and we all have responded to the sin in unrighteous ways. Some of our sins are more socially acceptable than others. But they're still sin. Amen. So I had a conversation recently, a situation happened recently, where I received an email from a man, a Christian man, who seemed like a nice person, who wrote to us in an email to our church office that came to me. He said he was a driver for Uber or Lyft, and he's from down in the valley, but he picked up someone here in Lancaster that needed a ride. Here's what he said in his email. He said, this person I met is, was a man who transitioned to a woman, but this person is now a Christian. And um, they can't find a church where they can be loved and accepted and grow in Christ. So this person, a stranger, wrote me and said, if I give you their name and phone number, would you reach out to them? Because they, they are a Christian and they need help to grow in Christ. So I wrote him back. I said, sure, I'll give him a call. So I uh, prayed uh, for myself. I prayed for the person before I called. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill me with his love and his grace and guide my conversation. And I called the person. And um, if anyone is listening to this, please don't take what I'm about to say in a demeaning way. I'm not saying that. We all know that people that can get in, sometimes people in homosexuality could go way overboard where men start trying to talk like women and but they, it's so exaggerated, it's more feminine than a woman. You know what I'm talking about? Like, hi, my name is, you know, and it's really, so it was that kind of conversation to start. 
And uh, I'm not saying that to put someone down. I'm just saying it's real brokenness. So I talked to the person. And I, I said I called because so-and-so. And they said, oh, yes, I remember that driver. I said, so I want to be some sort of a help to help you grow in Christ. What can I do? Where are you at? What's going on? And so as we talked for a while, they, they were telling me that they were, uh, no, they're not a man anymore. They're a woman and they're going to stay that way. And they're, they want to stay homosexual, transgender. So I lovingly told him, I said, well, Christ loves you, but he loves you enough to not only forgive your sins, but to deliver you from them. He wants you to come out of it. And of course, at that point, the person said, uh, basically, I'm giving you a condensed version of it because we were talking for a while. Actually, before I told him that, the first thing I said is, uh, this, it was a man I was talking to, but he wanted to be called Rose. So I, I said, before we go any further, can I give you a, share with you a testimony of a friend of mine? And I told him the whole story of David. And I told him how brokenness happens, how people get hurt, how we're sinned against, and then how we respond, and it causes us to become, we're distorted. We're not walking in God's way. He seemed to be sincerely uh, listening, and he seemed to be touched by that story. So I, after he heard that, I said, that's what God wants to do for you. If, you, if you're really going to be a Christian, walk with God. God wants you to be on the road of repentance and restoration where God saves you out of homosexuality, out of transgender. And at that point, he said, no, I believe God loves me just as I am. He made me this way. So we had an... And I addressed that. I said, God didn't make you that way. I said, you could even have surgeries. You could dress a certain way. But every cell, if you were born a male, yes, he said, I was. But now I'm a woman. I said, if you were born a male, God didn't make a mistake. Every cell in your body has male chromosomes in it. You can't change that. So you can pretend that you're female. But then what you're doing is you're living a lie. And liars don't get into the kingdom. So I said, he said, well, God loves me. I said, you're right. He does love you. He loves you enough to save you out of the sin. It's, you can't be saved and stay in sin. And I recognize that when it comes to repentance, we don't all repent perfectly the first time. Sometimes, it, you know, we work at it. But at least we ought to work at it. And so what it came down to finally was he believed that you could, he could be and stay transvestite or uh, transgender, homosexual. He could stay that way. And because he told me, Christ, I know Christ died on the cross for my sins, that that meant he could stay the way he was and he was covered. So I told him, well, I'm sorry. That's not what the Bible says. The gospel, it does not say that. It says repent and believe the gospel. So it, there's got to be something in you that uh, says, God, change me. God, liberate me. God, deliver me from this sin. Because you have to agree with him that God calls it sin. He said, well, I believe a different gospel than you. He said, I, must, I just believe in a different Jesus than you. And I said, I guess you do. He said, well, I'm going to stay like I am. I said, well, I have to warn you. If you stay like you are, uh, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. That's... And I'm not, I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what God himself said. And then he said, well, I'm going to end this conversation now. I said, okay, we ended the conversation. So later I got an email from the, the driver that asked me to call him. So he said, I'm falling. I'm checking. Did you reach out? I said, yes, I did. I said, I contacted that man. We had a talk. I was as gracious and loving as I could be, but I also spoke the truth. If we don't tell the truth, no one can ever get free. Jesus said, it's the truth that'll make you free. It's the truth spoken in love. Love without truth won't bring freedom, and truth without love won't bring freedom. We have to speak the truth in love. And so uh, I, I wrote him back, and I said, uh, he has no desire. He told me straight, he said, I will not 
change and I have no t intention ever of changing the way I am. So I said I couldn't help him. So that professing Christian, who I've never met just by email, the Uber or, or Lyft driver, wrote me back and uh, quite, a, quite a lengthy response to correct me and tell me that it's people like me that hurt the LGBT community by rejecting them and not loving them and that w if what I should do is something like buy them groceries and just show them the love of God. Now, I agree with him. We should show them the love of God. And we have, for more than 20 years, month after month, loved and given groceries to drug addicts, homosexuals, transvestites, and all kinds of broken people. We welcome them in here. We love them. We hug them. We pray for them. And we give them groceries. But I also tell them the truth. That unless you repent, you won't enter the kingdom. So I never uh, responded to that last email. But he's, he's under the belief... And this is what prompted me. <clears throat> I really believe it was the Holy Spirit because I tried to push it out of my heart. I tried to push, push this all out of my heart. Oh, that was just another person, another incident in the life of a pastor. I tried to push it out of my heart, but I couldn't. And it just stayed on my heart. And I felt the Holy Spirit wanted me to address this. Because there's many people who need to come out of the desolation of sin of sexual sin, sexual perversion, they've been sinned against or they're in sin or both. God wants to heal and bring restoration. But it doesn't come without repentance. But I didn't write this person back yet uh, that was telling me. And, and by the way, sometimes people can be a little bit manipulative with prophecy. Uh, rather than just say, I feel like it would be better if you love the person and get him some groceries. It was, it was put in the context of a prophetic word. My son, you have erred in the way you've treated this person. You must blah, blah, blah. And so that's kind of a manipulative way of using supposed prophecy. We should, we should grow out of that too. But anyway, that's not the main point. The main point is God loves people in sexual sin. He wants to restore people like he restored David, but it won't happen without repentance. And there is a false gospel, and it's deadly. Many people have bought into it, that you can just receive Christ, and they'll take the phrase, the finished work of Christ, and, and go beyond biblical boundaries with it, meaning I don't really have to do anything except believe this doctrine that I'm justified. Just do that. And that's it. It's all done. And that's what this guy seemed to believe. He seemed to believe that if he just believed that Christ died for him, without repenting, he was safe. And a, that's a false gospel. It's a false grace. It needs to be, to be dealt with. So uh, I told him, just like an alcoholic, and I wanted to know, it, it's not just, we're not just picking on homosexuals or transvestites. Any kind of sin... And I told him this on the phone when I talked to them. If, an, if there's a person that's an alcoholic uh, and you want to get into the kingdom of God, the Bible says very clearly drunkards will not inherit the kingdom. The Bible says also sorcery, which is the word pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmacy. It includes drug and alcohol abuse, marijuana and dope and different kinds of drugs that people use recreationally. In, in place of turning to God, they use drugs. People that do that will not enter the kingdom. So if someone comes to Christ, they have to not only ask for forgiveness for their sin, but they need to ask the Lord, looking to him in faith, Lord, deliver me from this. I, I want to repent of it, Lord. So without that, without repentance, you can't get into the kingdom. Let's look at some of that, um, some of what the Bible says. And hopefully... Uh, what I'm sharing now will equip you because this distorted grace gospel is so prevalent and it's so damaging because people that believe it go into darkness. They begin to live compromising. They'll compromise with sin and they just start going farther and farther down a dark, slippery path because they believe that if they believe the doctrine, they believe a set of words that Christ died for me, that's enough. But it's not. 
And let's look at what the scripture says. When Jesus came preaching, Mark chapter 1, the first words out of his mouth were this. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, repent means to change your mind and change your direction. Change your mind and therefore change your actions. It means to turn away from sin to God, from darkness to light, from Satan to God. When the Lord appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, he said, I've appointed you to turn people from light to darkness, from the power of Satan to the power of God. That's repentance. Repentance means turn away from what's wrong, turn away from dark, turn away from sin. Here's the Great Commission, Luke 24, verse 7. Jesus said, quote, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So notice the order. First comes repentance, then follows remission of sins. You see that again in Proverbs 28, verse 13. The Bible says, whoever covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So that's repentance, to confess and forsake it. God said, then you'll have mercy. Again, repent means change your mind from not believing God's word to believing it. Change your mind about what sin is so that you turn from it and turn to God. Change your deeds from evil to righteous. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Now again, we don't all repent perfectly and we don't all do God's will perfectly, but we ought to be doing the best we can to turn to Him. Amen. John the Baptist preached in Luke chapter 3, verse 7. John said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by Him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So John was warning them that there is a judgment day and they should flee from it. He said, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. So he said, there must be some sort of fruit in our life that shows there's been a repentance. And don't just say, Abraham's my father. Or in other words, Abraham believed in God, I believe in God. He said, don't just say that. Bring forth the fruit. He said, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even, in other words, if you want to just call someone a child of Abraham, God can do that with rocks. But he says, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, Jesus repeated that almost word for word in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked John, saying, what shall we do then? And he had, so there was something to do. Repentance requires us to do something, to turn away from dark, to turn toward light. And John answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, What shall we do? And he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. So there was something to do if they're going to repent. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. Why are we looking at these? It is so important that when we share Christ with people, we share the love of God. We share forgiveness that Christ offers. We share the power of the Holy Spirit to redeem and to restore and to liberate us from sin and demons and its bondages. But we must let people know that repentance is required for salvation. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. He rebuked them because they did not repent. Verse Matthew eleven twenty, He said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago 
in sackcloth and ashes. So there's Jesus' idea of repentance. Sackcloth and ashes means you abhor the way that you were living. That's what they would do in the Old Testament. They would put on sackcloth and put ashes on their head, and they would lament over their wickedness and turn away from it. Jesus rebuked the cities because he came with signs and wonders, but some of them, many of these did not repent. He said, woe unto you, because you did not repent. On judgment day, it's going to be worse for you than Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have the signs and wonders of Jesus. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. So the Word of God makes it clear that fornication, adultery, homosexuality, and all sexual uncleanness is sin. These sins will keep us from entering the kingdom of God. If we're messengers of the gospel of grace and of the love of God, at some point we must warn people that if they continue in these sins, they will suffer eternal perdition and, and separation from God forever. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Leviticus 20 verse 13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman... Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Here's what Jude 6 and 7 says. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but they left their own abode, God has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, and they've gone after strange flesh, they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, that's the New Testament, the gospel of grace. God said that Sodom and Gomorrah is an example for us of the eternal judgment of fire. God rained down fire and brimstone. Now, the word fornication in, in the Greek it's a big word. It covers every kind of sexual deviation, sin, and perversion outside of marriage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, Do not be deceived. Now, why did Paul have to tell them in their day, Don't be deceived? Because false doctrines were trying to infiltrate the church then as they are today, to make people think that the grace of God covers us so much that we don't have to repent. We can still live in sin, and God's grace will keep us from being condemned. So he said, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, no, nor thieves. A thief is someone that cheats at their business. You could be, have a trade and you charge people more. You cheat on the bill. Thieves, nor covetousness. Covetous. Covetous is materialism. Chasing money, chasing things. Nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now look at the next verse. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. He, su he said, such were some of you. So in the church... There were former homosexuals, sodomites, former thieves, former adulterers, former liars and cheaters, drunkards. He said, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That's what we are. We're not going to, into the kingdom because we're better than anybody. I'm not better than anybody. I'm only saved by the blood of Jesus and the mercy of God and the Holy Spirit in our life. So it's why we're saved. So he said, those that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom. Now the word fornication, I'm going to just break these down. It covers all kinds of sexual immorality, including adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, and bestiality. All of those that come under fornication. Homosexual includes male and female homosexuals. 
Sodomite includes men that act effeminate and male prostitutes. Thieves, people that cheat, lie, drunkards, covetous, materialistic, idolatry. Idolatry is worshiping anything other than God. Like sports, like recreation, like your job, like your vacation. Anything, your hobby. It's interesting that Romans chapter 1 connects homosexuality with the worship of the creation instead of the creator. In other words, idolatry is connected to spiritual darkness because of the idolatry, if you read Romans chapter 1, of worshiping the creation instead of the creator. He said, God, the wrath of God was revealed from heaven. There is a wrath of God revealed now on the earth. It's not his eternal judgment. It's not God's eternal wrath. Right now on earth, there are judgments of God taking place, but these judgments are intended to be redemptive. Eternal wrath doesn't come until we pass, God forbid, but if we pass through this life without repenting, then we're going to suffer eternal wrath. But it talks about the wrath of God revealed from heaven toward men who suppress the knowledge of the truth in unrighteousness, although what is known about God is available to them, they don't want to retain the knowledge of God. You can read in Romans chapter 1. It says, rather than worshiping the eternal God, it says his eternal characteristics are made known by his creation. The Bible says that creation speaks of the invisible attributes of God. So it says these, all men are without excuse. That's what the Bible says. So, so idolatry is somehow connected in not, maybe not every case, but in some cases, idolatry, worshiping creation. People worship lust. They worship sex. They worship pleasure. They worship sports. Because people make an idol out of those things, God said their foolish heart becomes darkened. Here's what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled. In other words, uh, pure union, sexual union between a married man and a woman is, is not defiled. The bed is undefiled. But he said, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So that's New Testament. So God loves people that are sinners. God loves people that have been sinned against. I, I'm, I believe God's heart is broken for people that are in bondage to sin. And God's heart is broken for people that have suffered abuse. And in the abuse we've suffered, we've responded in unrighteous ways and it's just taken us into further sin and further bondage. The answer is to come to Jesus. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, the works of the flesh are evident. They're adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. There's the word pharmakia. We get drugs, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, as I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So as we come to Christ, and we progressively, we learn to abide in Christ, we start bearing fruit. Fruit doesn't instantly appear as mature overnight. Anyone that has a fruit tree knows. For example, an orange tree. First of all, it takes a while for the tree, usually about three years, till they can start bearing any kind of edible fruit citrus tree. Then when the fruit begins to grow on the tree, it starts out small, green, hard. If you were to pick that fruit prematurely and try to eat it, it would be bitter and no way to eat it. But it's fruit. And that's why as we're growing in Christ, God does not, I don't believe God expects requires everybody to repent perfectly and completely. I don't believe that any of us do that.
But I believe he requires us to repent wholeheartedly. Because even if we don't repent perfectly or we don't just do it just right, we should do it with all of our heart. I know from my own experience, I've repented with all of my heart in areas. And I look back later and realize that wasn't a very good repentance. As I've grown in Christ, I can repent better than that. But at the time, I was wholehearted. So God's not asking us for full fruit, full maturity right now. He's asking us to do the best we can to turn from sin and turn to Him. And as we learn to progressively abide in Christ, His fruit comes. God's not uh, looking for instant, perfect, whole oranges. You don't go out on an orange tree. One day there's a blossom. The next day there's a big one pound orange juicy orange. Does it work like that? It's a little green hard thing. And it grows slowly. And it finally gets to the right size. It's still not ripe. If you eat it when it's green, it's bitter. It has to, it has to ripen. And over time, it gets sweet. It takes time. It takes time for us to abide in Christ and become like Him. So God's patient with us. God is full of grace. So he gives us the grace to repent and to keep repenting. And if we stumble to get back up and try again, we repent, if we, we repent, we realize I didn't repent very well, we try again. And God is with us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, he's working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we should repent of every kind of sin the best we can, seek to abide in Christ. And as we abide in him, by faith, his fruit starts coming. And when we start bearing the fruit, it says, against such there is no law. There's no law against love. The idea that someone can be a Christian and still be involved in willful sin, like fornication, homosexuality, adultery, pornography, hatred, drunkenness, drugs, any of that, that you can be a Christian and still be involved in that is delusion, is deception. Without repentance... There is no salvation. That's the real gospel. Repent and believe the good news. I want to tell you one more testimony. Since we're on the subject of, this won't take long, of healing and restoration from devastation. Now, I happen to be talking primarily about homosexuality because that was the issue that brought this up. But any, you can put in any sin in here. Any sin. God can heal us from, our, from the devastation of us being sinned against and the devastation our own sins have caused. When we sin, it devastates our own soul. It can devastate other people. The answer is not to uh, blame other people, hate other people that sinned against us. The answer is to forgive them and come to Christ. If you've been sinned against, I urge you to forgive who's ever sinned against you from the bottom of your heart and you come to Christ and ask him to heal your heart. That's what David did. He came to the Lord and God healed him. His father sinned against him. He forgave him. If he never forgave his father, he would never be healed. I uh, met and I used to hear him teach when I lived in the Coachella Valley. His name is Mike Williams. A wonderful man of God. Uh, when I met him, you could never, there was nothing about him in his voice, his mannerisms, the way he carried himself that ever would give you, it would be hard, it was hard to look at him and think that he at one time he was entrenched in deep homosexuality. There was a purity about him and the anointing of the Holy Spirit on his life. It was beautiful to see the restoration in his life. Mike Williams, his story, he was violated at nine years old. God, God have mercy. He said some men in his neighborhood sexually violated him at nine years old. And then he said it began to happen over and over. Now, unknown to Mike, and, and this is where I want to talk to people that are in, in sexual bondage. Unknown to Mike, when that happened, a demonic spirit entered him. I could go on and tell you stories about this because I've known people that have come out of homosexuality. I've 
personally, more than once, cast demons out of people and they got delivered from homosexuality. Okay? Mike did not know at the time when he was being violated, usually the perpetrator has a demonic spirit in, on them or in them. So uh, a spirit entered him. Now that's what happened with David, the first testimony I told you. As an infant, when his heart closed with hatred and judgment toward his father. I hate him. I'm going to be like my mom. He started becoming effeminate. He had to repent of that and accept who God made him to be. And he became a, the man God wanted him to be. But when we make the, we have that unforgiveness and those bitter vows, a demonic spirit can come and attach itself to our soul. And what it does is those spirits start feeding our thought life lies. They feed and nurse the bitterness. They feed, they want to keep us rehearsing the bitterness and the hurt because as long as we're in hatred and bitterness, they have a right to be on us. And then they want to lie to us and tell us, you're really a girl or you're a girl trapped in a boy's body. This is where these thoughts come from. They come from a spirit. But these demonic spirits are so subtle that people don't recognize them and they think that they're their own thoughts. The demon spirit who wants to oppress or possess uh, wants, does not want to be discovered because they want to stay with you. So what happened is Mike uh, f was violated at nine years old. He became demonized. Fr from that point on, he became effeminate and started living a homosexual life. He, I heard him describe the, the torment and uh, the suffering, the, the mockery, the rejection, the cruelty that was... He had to endure at school from other kids who made fun of him, threw rocks at him, spit on him because he was effeminate. And of course, he's a kid. He was violated. He has a demon now. He doesn't know why he's acting effeminate or why he has homosexual tendencies. And sure enough, he grew up and started getting in homosexual relationships. Now, Mike had a conscience. He said, I knew that it wasn't right to be homosexual. But I had these homosexual attractions and I couldn't stop it. But I didn't want, he said, as I got older, as a young adult, he said, I didn't want to be homosexual. And he said, uh, I thought that if I got married and just tried to love a woman, it would, it would straighten me out. So he said, there was a girl that I liked. I wasn't really romantic with her, but I liked her. And she loved me. And he said, so I married her. And he said, I did my very best to try to live straight. God. There has to be so many people that have this kind of torment going on. And it's hidden. He said, I tried to live straight. But long story short, he said, I ended up leaving my wife five times for men. He said, every time I did, he said, I actually loved her. I loved my wife. But I was overwhelmed with a drive to go and have sex with men. And he said, I couldn't stop it. See, this is what happens when a demon gets into a person. Mike had, it, had no idea there was a de an evil spirit inside him. He had no idea. He said, every time I left my wife, it absolutely broke her heart. And he said, it hurt me. He said, I felt horrible because I loved her. But I couldn't control myself. So he said, the last time I left her, the fifth time, he said, he said, I didn't want to break her heart. He said, I knew I couldn't control myself, but I didn't want to break her heart. So what I did was, I lied to her. He said, even though I loved her, I went to her. He said, I wanted to try to get her to hate me because I thought if I could make her hate me, then when I left, her heart wouldn't be broken. So I came and I cussed at her and I was as mean and nasty. I think he spit on her. He said, I was as nasty as I could. And, and Mike's wife, by the way, was a born-again Christian. And he said, I li and I lied to her. He said, I told her I don't love her. He said, I really did. But I told her I don't love her and I left. And he said, as I was walking out. He 
She said, Mike, I'll never stop loving you. And I'll never stop praying for you. And she didn't. She never stopped. So Mike said, I left. He, at one point, he said, I, my life went into just a, a horrible, miserable lifestyle. At one point, he ended up for a short time in, in a psychiatric ward. He said, I remember huddled in the bottom of a shower in a fetal position, just in total misery. And he said, then I finally decided to commit suicide. He said, I tried a few times and it didn't work. I don't know what he tried. He said, oh, he said, I, I went to different ministers. I went to four or five pastors asking them if they could help me. And none of them knew, that he went to, knew anything about that the homosexuality, the root of it is demons in there. I want to say this to anybody that's watching. I know this, if you're in homosexuality or some kind of sexual perverse bondage, you may not believe this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And please listen to the rest of this message. I believe 99.9% .9 of all people in homosexual lifestyles have a demon inside them. And it holds you in bondage. And, it's, and until you get deliverance, you can't get free. And you can't get deliverance until you turn to Christ. But anyway, well, I'll get to that. Mike said uh, he'd gone to different ministers. He said nobody knew how to help him. He said, one, God forgive this pastor, one of them was a hyper-Calvinist that believes God predestined some people to be saved and some to be lost. He said, Mike, some people have to be predestined to be lost, and you're, I guess you're just one of them. And so, yeah, isn't that horrible? And that, by the way, anyone listening, that's not true. It's God's will that none should perish. That's what the Bible says. God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that he turn, there's repentance, rather that he turn and live. And so... Uh, Mike was, got an idea. He got some chains, heavy chains that he used to tow cars with in the trunk of his car. And he got a padlock. He said, I got chains. I was going to wrap my chains around myself and jump over the bridge into the river. The chains would take me to the bond. I was going to drown myself. Before I did, one of my friends knew I was going to do it. And he said, Mike, before you do it, he said, there's a man you need to go see. His name is Norval Hayes. He, we know people he's ministered to and they've gotten out of homosexuality. So Mike said, okay, this will be my... You sure? They said, yeah, we think Norval can help you. He said, this will be my last chance. I'll go see Norval Hayes. And if he can't help me, at, right after I leave his house, I'm driving to the river. I'm going to kill myself. So he went to Norval Hayes' house and uh, he sat down and he said Norval Hayes was a very loving, kind man. And um, he said, what's your problem? He said, I'm homosexual. He said, but I don't want to be. He said, I want to be heterosexual. I know there's something wrong with me, but I don't know how to change. He said, can you help me? Norval Hayes said, yes, I can. Now, don't stop watching this message till the end because you need to hear the rest of this. Norval Hayes said, yes, I can. I can help you. What Mike said, what he did next shocked me. He walked right over to me, put his hand on my head and said, Come out of him, you foul devil. I bind you, you perverse spirit. Come out, you homosexual spirit. Leave him now. I bind you. Mike said, I couldn't believe he was saying that. There's no demon in me. And he said, but he was such a nice man. I didn't want to just get up and leave. So I thought, I'm going to humor him, and I'm going to stay here until he's done praying. And when he's done, I'll politely excuse myself and go jump in the river. And he said, as I sat there, he said he must have gone 15 to 20 minutes straight. He must have said 200 times, I said, I bind you. Come out of him. I bind you, you foul spirit. Leave him now. And he said over and over, and he wouldn't budge. And I learned this from Norval, and I've... In my experience, I believe normal is true because the experiences that I had is true. If you're in homosexuality, you have a demon, you need deliverance. Mike said, I sat there for about 15 minutes, just quiet. And after 15 to 20 minutes, the strangest thing happened that scared me. He said, I felt an entity in my gut dislodge and start moving around inside me. It terrified me. And he said, come out! 
out, you foul thing. And he said, it started coming up, come up, come up, out my throat. And I went, oh, and out it came. He said, I felt free. Something dark left me. He said, I began to cry. He said, I felt free. I said, what happened? What happened? Norval said, you got set free. Then Norval prayed for me. He said, God, would you heal his soul and restore his desire for his wife? And then Norval bought him a hotel room and said, and said you go stay in the hotel. He said, I believe that God's going to give you your love for your wife back and re- give you desire to be with her. He said, when it does, he said, call me. I'll buy you a plane ticket home. The next day, Mike called Norval Hayes. He said, Norval, I feel brand new. I love my wife. I miss my wife. I want to be with my wife. He flew home, was completely set free, got back with his wife, and has been with her for all these years. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. But listen. He couldn't get delivered when he went to somebody that just tried to counsel him. You can't counsel a demon. You have to cast it out. And you can't cast it out. Now, Mike got delivered because he wanted to be. Mike was looking for freedom. And if you want to get delivered of evil, you have to want it. You've got to come to Jesus and say, God, help me. But that's what I wanted to say in this message about homosexuality. It's, uh, I know it's a stigma in our culture, but it's not a worse bondage than another sin. It's terrible. It's tormenting. It's devastating. But if, if you're in sexual sin of pornography, of fornication, of bondage to lust, any kind of sexual deviation or perversion, if you stay in that, you're not going to enter the kingdom. God loves you. And God can set you free. But what you have to do is repent. Here's what God said in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. God said, come and let's reason together. If your sins are as red as scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. In Ezekiel 33, 11, God said, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his sins and live. God says, now turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? 2 Peter 3, 9, God is long suffering toward us, He's not willing that any should perish. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have the gift of everlasting life. Proverbs 1, verse 23. God says, turn at my rebuke. If you're watching this and you're in sin, turn at the rebuke of God. He loves you. He won't condemn you. He'll forgive you and set you free. God said, turn at my rebuke. Surely I'll pour out my spirit upon you. Proverbs 1, 23. Psalm 86, verse 5 says, Lord, you're good. You're ready to forgive. And you are rich in mercy to everyone who calls on your name. So God loves people. God loves the whole world. He loves us whether we've been sinned against or whether we've sinned against someone. If we're a perpetrator, he loves us. If we're a victim, he loves us. He wants us to repent. If you repent, confess, forsake, you'll find mercy. God will forgive your sin. He'll deliver you from demons if you have demons. And he'll make you whole. He said, turn and I'll pour out my spirit upon you. Proverbs 1, 23. That's the gospel of grace. There is no salvation without repentance. There's no such thing as a gospel where you can be saved without repenting. Turn and come to Jesus. You receive forgiveness and healing. Amen. So share this video with your friends who need to hear it.